this is going to be a marathon. This is not a sprint. I heard a donor say early on in this crisis that this is the rainy day we've all been saving for. So give more than you normally would, but use your head to plan for the long term. Welcome to The Value in Giving. I'm your host and president of Vanguard Charitable, Jane Greenfield. On this podcast, we'll hear from leaders across the world of philanthropy. They'll share tips and stories with us to help people and organization make the most of their charitable efforts. On today's show, we have Victoria Vrana, who is deputy director of the philanthropic partnership team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thanks so much for joining me today, Victoria. Thanks for having me, Jane. Well, it's great to uh, be here with an expert in the land of philanthropy at a very, very important time when the need has really never been greater. Um, So I'll start by asking you to share with us a little bit about what the Philanthropic Partnership Team does at the Gates Foundation. So the Philanthropic Partnership Team is a program strategy team at the Foundation, just like the polio team or the K-12 education team or the giving team. Our mission is to inspire and enable informed and intentional generosity by all. We believe that when people have the right tools, insights, and inspiration, they'll give more and they'll give better. And we have a number of programs focused on this goal. First, we support the Giving Pledge community. We work with donors when they take the pledge, and then we provide information to them and their families and their staff to help them with their philanthropy. We also work with donors who specifically want to give alongside the Gates Foundation, and we have a number of ways we help donors work with us. There are two other parts of the team. One is our work on the giving ecosystem. So we help support the infrastructure that helps people give, things like a favorable policy and regulatory environment, increasing the supply of data so people can make good decisions about their giving. And then finally, we celebrate and support everyday donors. Through our Giving by All program, we partner with great organizations in the sector to better understand donor behavior and create new products and tools to support giving. We have over 50 grantees and partners, folks like Giving Tuesday, Global Giving, Donors Choose, the Lilly School of Philanthropy at Indiana University, amazing organizations doing great work. And you've also done a fair amount to work with donor advised funds like Vanguard Charitable. Tell us a little bit about how you've worked with us. Absolutely. So, you know, donor advised funds are places where donors can both give more and give better. We've partnered with Vanguard and others to test out new innovations like curated lists of giving opportunities. And we work together to better understand what donors need to support and advance their giving goals. It's great. We've really enjoyed working with you. It gives us all a lot better insight into um, not only how philanthropists behave, but really what they need and how we can help. So before we go into uh, chatting a little bit about how to help in this really unique environment, tell me a little bit about your background and what brought you to the Gates Foundation. I've spent my career in the social sector. So I started out as the first employee of a really small international women's organization. And I always keep that in mind. The challenges small nonprofits face are incredibly difficult as they're trying to do some of the hardest work in our sector. So I always think about that as a grant maker. Right before I came to the Gates Foundation, I spent 12 years at the Marino Institute and Venture Philanthropy Partners, where I gained a ton of experience working with donors and helping nonprofits scale to serve children and youth of low-income families in the D.C. metro region. I learned so much firsthand about the inequities right in my backyard and what it really takes to help organizations expand. Well, that's great. And what a great background to do it. Uh, I'll tell you, we have uh, a lot of people at Vanguard Charitable who were part of smaller charities that really understand the importance of every donation. And so on our side, when they see money go out the door to those charities, they know what it means. They know what that does for the charity's ability to drive their mission. So, you know, backgrounds are really, really important. Um, Let's talk a little bit now about 
the COVID crisis. So at Vanguard Charitable, we're doing a lot to help support COVID relief. We're sharing a lot of information and insight with our donors on how and where to give. And we're sending a lot of reminders to our donors that they're actually uniquely situated to jump in and help since they have a donor advised fund. So we're doing our part for sure. Um, but tell us a little bit how the Gates Foundation is supporting COVID-19 relief, both locally and globally. The Gates Foundation has been working on the pandemic since January, when we really had a sense of what was coming. We've remained committed to our core areas of funding, but we're increasingly turning our new dollars and the expertise of our staff and our partners to COVID. Bill and Melinda have been worried about pandemics for a long time, and along with others, they've been funding pandemic and epidemic preparedness for years. So our funding for COVID-19 falls into four areas. One, vaccines. Two, diagnostics. Three, therapeutics. And four, protecting the most vulnerable populations, particularly in Asia and Africa. We're moving quickly to identify therapeutics, diagnostics, and vaccines and get them through clinical trials, manufacturing, and to market. In February, so kind of right after things started, we launched a therapeutics accelerator with the Wellcome Trust and others. The accelerator is doing what it sounds like. It's rapidly assessing pharmaceutical companies' libraries to determine whether there's existing therapies or drugs or drug combinations that can be repurposed. Our goal is to have something to market as early as the end of the year. Developing and delivering diagnostics that can be used in low resource settings is a top priority. Diagnostics, along with vaccines, are critical to ending the pandemic. Everybody knows that we have to be able to get testing out there and get it everywhere. We're also hyper-focused on the development of low-cost vaccines for COVID-19. We're working with the Center for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, or CEPI. It's an organization we co-founded after the West Africa Ebola outbreak to overcome the bottleneck of time in getting vaccines to market. There are currently a handful of promising vaccine candidates. The race is on to develop the safest one that can be manufactured at scale at the lowest price and then quickly get it out there within 12 months would be ideal. When you look at, and I know you and I will talk more about funding in a little bit, All of the funding that everyone is doing in the response in many ways will be dwarfed by what it'll take to get a vaccine to 7 billion people. On both the everyday donor front, the government front, the institution front, it's going to be an amazing push to make that happen. And finally, I'll say a little bit about what we're doing for the most vulnerable populations. So as soon as we understood COVID-19 was turning into a pandemic, We started quickly funding organizations on the ground in Africa, India, and other parts of South Asia. We're funding centers for disease control and working with a host of excellent partners um, to connect with government, ministries of health, and support health systems. In the U.S., we're also doing a lot. Seattle is our backyard of our headquarters, and so we've been working across that region by funding multiple local community foundations, homeless shelters, and food banks, providing technical and financial support to King County. We funded the Seattle flu study, which identified the very first case of COVID-19 in Seattle in January. I was there at the time and saw the headlines. Um, And then with other funders, we quickly evolved that study into something called SCAN, the Seattle Coronavirus Action Network. And they launched a swab and send program. We started testing 300 people a day across the region. And now the testing program is testing at least 5,000 people per day in Seattle. We hope that can be a model for others. Well, that's great. It's, it's no surprise that the Gates Foundation was well ahead and organized and ready for this. Because as you said, this has been something that Bill and Melinda Gates have really been preparing for for a long time. And it's, uh, it's also no surprise to see how focused your goals are, but also how big they are. I think you have this brand of taking on big, big problems in a focused and really pragmatic manner. So it gives me a lot of hope to have um, your focus on these these important things. You know, one thing that's interesting is a lot of philanthropists, um, particularly those who have donor advised funds, are really thoughtful and planful about their philanthropy. They really, they have long-term goals in terms of how to make a difference and impact against a cause that they care about. 
And yet these very same philanthropists are also the first to rush in the minute there's a disaster and help is needed. I'd be interested in hearing your perspective on how does having a long-term giving strategy and and being a long-term philanthropist actually support the work and the focus on the work that you're doing? I mean, we're going to need resources for a long time to come tackling this problem. Not only the immediate response, but then the recovery, the building towards resilience, and the going back and repairing and reimagining so many of the kind of underlying systemic weaknesses we're seeing across the board um, because of the crisis. And so a long-term strategy means you pace yourself at whatever scale you're at. It also means joining with partners. And, you know, Jane, you talked about the ambitious goals the foundation has. I also think about it as the goals that all of our partners have with us. If we were doing this alone, we could never have those grand ambitions at scale. But because of our nonprofit partners, our funding partners, all of the many folks we're working with, we can have these big goals. But we also know that it will take time to reach them. So you have to pace yourself through this kind of crisis. Disasters in the past have had such a different flavor than what we're going through right now. Disasters in the past have been much more specific, targeted, localized, time bound, uh, et cetera. And this is just so far reaching. It's a medical crisis. It's an economic crisis. It's global in nature. Are you seeing any changes in giving in response to COVID-19? Anything that's uh, different or surprising to you? There's a few things and time will tell as we move along and how it plays out. But we're seeing some changes both in how people are funding and what they're funding. So on the how, many funders have moved to more flexible, rapid support for their grantees, especially institutions and foundations that often have a lot of parameters in their giving. For individual givers, everyday donors and others, often their support is already general operating support. It's already flexible funding, which is why that kind of funding is so incredibly valuable for nonprofits, so they can apply it however they need. But we are seeing more kind of institutional funders loosening restrictions, funding more like an everyday giver. We're also seeing a lot more collaborations by funders. We're seeing places where a funder will say, hey, I know about education, so I know how to pivot my funding and education to help with the 90% of kids who are home right now, but I don't know vaccine development. And so we're seeing donors follow upon each other's areas of expertise and pool money together because the needs, of, as you've said, are so great um, that if you can join with others, whether it's a bunch of friends getting together to give $100 instead of 20 or whether, again, it's larger donors making big gifts and all kinds of unusual donors, you know, folks you wouldn't see normally getting together, but they're all united behind food or behind research or behind whatever cause it is. On the What People Fund, we've seen um, a big increase in individuals and institutions supporting direct cash transfers. So this was something kind of more on the fringe of philanthropy, like getting money directly in the hands of people for them to decide what to do with it. There's some great organizations like Give Directly who are testing this and doing this in all kinds of places. It's exploded right now. That is interesting. So on the flexibility and collaboration perspective, we are definitely seeing a little bit of that with our donors as well. Um, it will be interesting to see, you know, the speed of giving and getting the money to the person or the organization that needs it quickly is is another thing that we're seeing. So for example, we are seeing our donors step up and give more. And we've been clear in our messaging that it's incredibly valuable to give in an unrestricted manner so that the organization, the charity that is receiving the money can use it in the way it's used best. Um, and we, even just in the month of March, we saw an increase in unrestricted giving from 60% to 70%. 
It's just incredible. So our donors are great. They're reaching out to Vanguard Charitable as a resource and they're listening. When it comes to, you know, getting money to where it's needed quickly, we heard from a number of our donors, not only did they want to send money out the door, but they wanted to know how quickly was it going to get there. And it caused us to step back and reprioritize the way we grant and make sure that the grants that are tagged as COVID-19 grants go out the door first. They get our top priority. And when it comes to COVID-19 tagged grants, over the last six weeks, $60 million has gone out the door and quickly just for COVID. So let me ask you, Victoria, how are you working with donors and other nonprofit organizations to address the rapidly growing needs around the relief effort? So we see you have a great focus um, but how do you actually work with with donors and nonprofits to get it done? So we're a big triage center. You know, everything that comes into the foundation, every donor looking for a recommendation or wanting the foundation to know what they're doing or looking to connect with other funders, we are taking in those requests and as quickly as we can, matching them up to resources that people need. One of the things folks are looking for is guidance on how to fulfill that impulse to help right now. And then again, how to pace yourself for the long haul and how to think about using resources over time. So there's no perfect formula or answer to that, but we're helping donors think through that. With nonprofits, just like you said, I mean, every nonprofit organization, whether they're directly working on COVID or not, is affected right now. And many of them are in jeopardy of closing their doors, depending on what they do. You know, at the foundation, um, we were lucky. We have laptops. We have um, uh, virtual platforms we can use to connect. We didn't always use them very much, you know, and we had to learn little things and find our headsets. But you know, we had that technology for so many nonprofits, they don't have all that in place that even the move to everybody working at home wasn't seamless. And organizations are still struggling to catch up. In addition, having virtual fundraisers and virtual conferences and virtual support groups and virtual everything. So many nonprofits work with people. And so how do you do that virtually? So one of the things we're doing at the foundation is checking in with each and every one of our grantees. We have over 15,000 grantees across the world. And so all of our program officers, all of our program teams are checking in with folks to say, how are you doing? What do you need? How is your work changing because of COVID? Um, really j- trying to make sure we can be the best partners we can to our immediate partners in our universe. Well, that's great. Gosh, 15,000, you said? That's amazing. It's a lot of grantees. <laughs> It's a lot of grantees. We, we've we been reaching out to some of the grantee organizations that we serve as well. Um, when we're noticing that checks are going out the door and they're not yet cashed, we're calling to find out, can you actually access them? Do you need us to send it electronically? So we're doing everything that we can to help as well. But it's, uh, I'll tell you, it's a very important effort. Now, one of the things that I know about you, Victoria, is that you have done research on past crises, past disasters, and you're taking a moment to step back and compare the insight that you've gotten from this research to what you're seeing in this COVID crisis. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, we're trying to compile all of the research from different times, both from disasters that are health related, that are natural disasters, and then times of economic downturn. We have to prepare for all of those things at once, kind of facing us and the sector. And of course, this is unprecedented. You know, nothing, nothing compares exactly to what we're facing right now. But some of the lessons we can take for the past is that the most vulnerable populations are disproportionately affected, whether you're talking about in the U.S. or around the world. So there are countries, there are communities, there are states, there are cities, there are neighborhoods that are going to be facing much harder hits um, than others. And so funders need to make sure their resources are reaching those populations and really look for bias in grant making during this time and make sure you know how to get the resources to those populations. One of the other things we know about disasters like this, and you and I have talked about this, the emergency response is where our heart goes. 
You know, the, you look at the news, you can't help but want to get resources out there right away. But our heads have to stay engaged to make sure we're investing in the recovery and the resilience effort. I'm hearing much more people talking about a reimagining phase right now, that there's so many structural imbalances and weaknesses have been laid bare by this pandemic. How are we going to take the opportunity for reinvention so we emerge stronger? And that's investment in things that are much beyond the immediate response. That's been talked about in previous disasters, and there's some bright spots where people have really taken that on just even in physically rebuilding buildings, let's say, in a tornado, but it doesn't always happen. And so we're going to have to pay special attention to this crisis to make sure we really do prepare in a different way for the future. Well, that, uh, that's a good segue to a question that I've talked to a number of experts in the field about, because um, I think it's very much on all our minds. And that is, what do you think the long-term impact of COVID-19 on philanthropy will be? Because, you know, to your point, re- a reimagining phase it may be incredibly important coming out of this particular crisis, but reimagining will take some money. That's exactly right. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the changes that are happening in grant making, and I hope and I believe that some of those will stick. Some of this more flexibility of funding, um, this getting money out the door more quickly, loosening up some of the bureaucratic things that are barriers to getting money to those in the front lines fast. The need for information And the reliance on others' expertise and trusting folks could also really lead to an investment in that kind of infrastructure and data. We're hearing over and over again, I'm curious if you're hearing this from donors too, people would really like to be able to see a map right now of all the needs and where all the money's going. The philanthropic money, the government money, so you can make the best decisions. When when the need is so urgent, And the resources, no matter how great they are, no matter how generous everyone is, the the resources don't quite meet the need. And so we have to invest in infrastructure for the long term. So we have the information we need, not just for this crisis, but for all of the challenges we're going to face in the future. So actually, the power of networks and infrastructure and connection and collaboration and data right now will demonstrate the importance of investing in that for the future. That's a great point. And, you know, it's it's interesting you say that we um, not only have an opportunity as Vanguard Charitable to provide information and insight to our donors on how best to support and be part of the solution, but we also figured we had a good opportunity to reach out and ask some questions of them. We have a very highly engaged donor population. And so we sent a survey out to our donors. We got a huge response, which was great. And one of the questions we asked was around where they were going for information. And, um, you know, most of them said our number one spot is Vanguard Charitable's website. We go to you and we find out, you know, what you're saying. And so... Um, so it's, it's a great point. And, you know, it, it probably does uh, really point to the need to kind of step back more and think about um, how can we connect the dots more for philanthropic people. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to mix it up for a minute here, Victoria, and I'm going to ask you some more personal questions. So you obviously have this great background in philanthropy and policy. What makes your work with the Gates Foundation so personal to you? I think part of it is having worked on the front lines of social change, and I've always been a kind of nonprofit social change person, but that meeting that need is so challenging. And, you know, I remember what it was like to be in a nonprofit where we worked in one big room. And there was a day when we had a funder who was coming to visit. 
and we realized we wanted to offer offer him coffee and we didn't have a coffee maker. So we went out to CVS to buy a coffee maker to offer the funder coffee, you know? So I, I remember those days. I remember those dynamics and I remember that relationship between getting the resources you need to really fuel your work. That I'm a systems person. And so, you know, I want to help thousands of people and thousands of organizations. And, you know, the longer, the more experience I gain, the more I want to be able to change the system. And so at the Gates Foundation, working in this this really unique space of, of philanthropic infrastructure, I mean, who even thought that could be a job? Uh, I have the opportunity with my colleagues and my partners and grantees and organizations like Vanguard Charitable and others that we work with to build a better system and improve that system. And those investments in the system can help nonprofits, thousands of them, over time. And we can also reach thousands of donors. So I'm super inspired by being able to take on that kind of systems work. I'm also really inspired by the work of my colleagues and the many, the many, many critical areas we tackle at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We believe that all lives have equal value, and that belief guides everything the foundation does, and that comes straight from Bill and Melinda. That's a belief I hold close to my heart. And so just to be a small part of that is uh, immensely gratifying. Well, it, it's it's definitely a, an inspirational um, concept to align with. A different question on the work that you've done with the Gates Foundation. How has that work changed your perspective on an issue associated with giving? So I'm a huge believer in measuring and monitoring impact for continuous improvement. At my previous job at Venture Philanthropy Partners, I was the vice president of assessment and communication. So combining two different things, but really looking at measurement and evaluation, I get super geeky about data. I believe that if you're a nonprofit leader, knowing the impact that you're having on lives and communities should really be keeping you up at night. At the same time, I haven't given up on the idea of a standard system for measuring results, but in the last eight years of the Gates Foundation, I understand so much more how weak our underlying data is in the social sector and just how complicated it is. You know, so one of the things I've learned through my work at the foundation is that we need shortcuts. We need easy ways that donors can have a sense of the quality of a giving opportunity. It's got to be fun and simple, though. It's got to have rigor, but it's got to be fun. So we have a lot of partners and we there's a lot of passion in the field for this. And I'm optimistic that we're going to get some solutions, but I also know it's going to take a long time. Well, it's good work. I'm a numbers girl, so I appreciate your focus on this. Um, in your experience right now, what would be the best way for people to either see or measure their giving dollars? So, you know, you and I were just talking about this, the donors asking you, how much should I give? Yeah. The very first thing people have to do is know their intent. What causes mean the most to you? What do you, what do you intend to fund? What do you want to fund? What's the change you or your family want to see in the world? And then how are you doing? It's actually really hard to get at that because we give in so many different ways. Now, I think If you have a donor advice fund, it might be a little easier because if you give from one vehicle and you track it and you see it and you get a reflection back on on how much you're giving and to what, that's a great tool. All donors need those kind of tools because so much of giving is impulsive. You give because friends or family ask, and that's lovely. Like that should never change. But at the end of the year, you could get through a whole year and not really know what you gave to and, and not really have tackled the, the challenges that you care the most about. So knowing your intent, tracking your own giving, I feel like is the very first step in the journey. That's great advice. And I know that, you know, just based on my discussions with donors at Vanguard Charitable, they are asking more and more questions. I'd say over the last decade, the focus on really understanding the organization that you're giving to and understanding what impact might mean, how they measure that and and what you could expect them to do with the dollars that you're giving, that's become a much bigger thing. Okay, so now um, we'll wrap up with a few questions, Victoria. Um, And these questions are questions that 
I often get from donors. I'm sure you do as well. Um, so we'll give you a chance to speak directly to our listeners. So what would be your most important piece of advice in addition to what you just said right now for donors? What's the most important thing for them? Act quickly with your heart, but use your head to plan for the long term. This is going to be a marathon. This is not a sprint, as one of my colleagues continues to remind me. I heard a donor say early on in this crisis that this is the rainy day we've all been saving for. So give more than you normally would, but also plan it out and pace yourself. That's a great, that's a great quote. This is the rainy day. Um, we've heard a lot from our donors as well, just saying, we're so thankful we have this donor advised fund. We can give years worth of charitable gifts right now, right when it's needed. For nonprofits, what would be your most important piece of advice right now for them? You know a lot about this field. So for nonprofits, now is really the time to pivot. Take what you know how to do well and turn it on its head to apply it in this crisis. It's the time to innovate. It's the time to let go of how you've normally done things. How can they do things differently right now, no matter what they do, and really push themselves to innovate? It's the same for funders and donors, too. It's not just all on nonprofits. We all have to do things differently right now. It's a great point. You know, interestingly, um, yesterday I attended a gala fundraising event that is done every year by a nonprofit that I support. And it is a fashion show that they do. And they did it all virtually. And it was fabulous. And they pivoted like that was a big, big undertaking to go from a live event that they knew how to do with their eyes closed to something very, very unique. Um, so yes, that's just one example. But I think um, being flexible, being innovative, pivoting, very important. The final question I have for you, Victoria, is one that will be near and dear to your heart. And that is, if a donor really wanted to support the great work that the Gates Foundation is doing, can they give to you in the same way they would give to a public charity? Absolutely. Gates Philanthropy Partners is the public charity arm of the Gates Foundation, and it was created a few years ago to open the foundation doors to anyone to co-fund with us with donations of any size. We opened it in response to donations we were getting and frankly couldn't quite handle. And so setting up this public charity allows us to partner with everyone. Gates Philanthropy Partners launched its Combating COVID-19 Fund back in mid-March. And since then, it's received donations starting at $10 and ranging up to $25 million. So it's quite possible and, and we welcome partners. Well, that's fabulous. So I, I think based on our conversation today and how you've outlined the work that you're doing and how smart it is, how focused it is, and really how pragmatic it is, I'm sure there'll be people who are listening who will be very interested in the answer to that question. So really appreciate the time that you spent with me today, Victoria. Thanks so much for joining me. And, um, and many thanks to our audience for listening. There's so much need right now. We appreciate you tuning in. I hope everyone found today's show interesting and informative. And I hope that you all find the value in giving. <music>